Hello, everyone, and welcome to the book discussion for uh, June for A Year of Reading Dangerously. I'm so glad you're here uh, to talk uh, with with us about another book and I'll just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started is that if you've called in by telephone uh, your phone line is currently muted but if you'd like to ask Phyllis a question or make a comment to Phyllis you can type star 2 on your keypad and that will raise your hand I'll know that you have uh, something to say and then I'll unmute your line and I'll try to remind you of that during the middle of the call but it's star 2 on the keypad of your phone is what you need to press and then if you're listening on your computer you can feel free to type in the chat box and you can um, type in any questions or comments there and I can read those to Phyllis as well as we go on uh, with our conversation so um, I want to welcome Phyllis Schachter, who is the author of the book, Choosing to Die, A Personal Story, Elective Death by Voluntarily Stopping Eating and Drinking in the Face of Degenerative Disease. Phyllis, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to be on this conversation with us tonight. Oh, thank you, Karen, for inviting me. And thank you so much for choosing my book as one of your books for this year. I think that it's this is a very important topic that is of interest to most people of varying ages. Well, I agree, and I, I felt that it it's so important that we have conversations about options that are avail, available to people at the end of life, and your book makes it very clear and very easy to follow Alan's choice and uh, also for people to learn about about the choice of VSED and what it consists of and then your advice on how to actually prepare for that is just invaluable and there's really nowhere else I think that people could find anything like this so that's why I want I chose your book um, for this month's uh, this month's reading selection yeah thank you I mean my book definitely is both a memoir and a guidebook and I've had people contact me after their loved one had passed and said thank you, we used your book as a guidebook, you know, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psych psychiatrist or anybody in the mental health field, but um, I think that my personal experience is invaluable and there is no other book out there like this. And so I'm very grateful. And, you know, another thing that I think will be of interest to the listeners along this line in terms of my book being the only book like this is that for about the last, since about the beginning of March, I've been in contact with a film producer who um, was a vice president of Warner Brothers at one time. He's just toward the end of his career now. And he learned about me through a networking experience of somebody who heard me speak last February at a conference at Seattle University. And he said he has told me that he is totally dedicated to making a film based on Alan's and my story. And um, this is really thrilling for me because this is really the biggest opportunity for people all over the world to, to learn about this in a deeper way. And I'm very optimistic. Our first legal document is supposed to be signed, you know, next week. This could be probably a year or two kind of experience, but um, I'm just being optimistic and, and we'll see how it all moves forward and, you know, and we'll see. But um, I, I'm, this, this was really Alan's last, one of his last wishes was that everybody know about voluntary stopping eating and drinking, and um, this is my work now. Well, that's really exciting, Phyllis, to hear about the possibility that a film will be made which will just increase the reach of your message um, to far more people. And I did want to say that for those of us who work in hospice and have been with dying patients many times at the end of life, we are well aware that at the very end of life, in the stages of active dying, people everyone stops eating and drinking uh, voluntarily the body shuts down the body loses its interest in food and water and so those of us in hospice understand that as part of the natural dying process but your book illuminates so well that it is a choice that can be made when when 
a person knows that it is time, that it's it's time to go. And I have heard of other patients who had just, uh, they knew they were in the dying process, they were in hospice, but they felt ready and that it was time and they chose to stop eating and drinking. And your book is so helpful because it teaches people how to care for someone who makes the choice and how to keep them comfortable and how to be um, be at their side and be present for them. Right. Thank you. I think the distinction you're making is very important because my husband's body, his physical body, was mostly not his brain, which is a significant part of the body. His brain was not healthy. The rest of his body was healthy. And so he made this very deliberate conscious choice while he was in the middle stages, while he was still mentally capable. So he didn't have to live into the late stages like his mother had done and my father had done. And um, for me, as I read about that, it it seems to me that that choice required so much courage for Alan and also courage for you to be at his side. And I just, I, I'm, you know, I'm in awe of that because I look at myself and wonder if I would have the courage and the strength to do that. And I just wonder where, where do you feel, where did your courage come from? Where did Alan's courage come from? Um, his courage came from a different place than my courage. I think the interest in the film, the, if the film, uh, you know, follows through and it occurs, it's going to be a love story drama because that is what drew the producer to, to the story, not just the VSED, but the love story behind it. I would say my courage came from a deep, deep well of love for my husband in honoring his request and decision to do this. I, he did not ask me every step of the way as he was trying to figure out what to do once he got the diagnosis. He didn't keep asking me my opinion. I just let him know that I was going to support him in whatever he, cho- whatever he decided to do. His courage came from he, I, 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 a, a, a place of preparation um, really th- throughout his life of, of facing difficult things that come along. Um, he felt that he would rather, um, he was clear. He, had, he was knowledgeable about what it meant to die of Alzheimer's. It's not a pleasant way to die. And he was very clear that he was, you know, that he did not want to die that way. And, um, you know, my husband had meditated for many years. He was a spiritual man. He was a learned man. He read. He exposed himself to different ideas throughout his life. And I think he used both his heart and his head to come to terms with this. And as he, you know, he acknowledged that he lived a good life. And he was very, very, very curious about what was going to come next, meaning that he felt something was going to come next. Um, that's interesting. So it sounds like he had more curiosity than fear uh, about dying. Absolutely. I would say he had a tremendous amount of curiosity. He did not exhibit a lot of fear. Um, he had a lot of equanimity as a person. And he was, uh, he was 50 years old and I was 40 years old and we began our relationship. And um, I watched him navigate, you know, some very difficult things and challenging things in his life in the years that we were together. And he did approach things with um, with a great deal of equanimity. He did. Mm. And uh, Phyllis, one thing that struck me um, as I was reading the book is that Alan was very clear about what quality of life meant to him. And it seems like that was pivotal in choosing the timing, the right timing, is that he understood what quality of life was even when he had lost all of the other, everything else that he had valued or cared about in his life. He he had a clear idea of what that meant. And I, I if I remember correctly, it was being able to go to the spiritual center. And um, so I, I just wondered if you talk about like the importance of that. I, I hear people talking about it all the time. We want quality of life, quality of life. But um, 
to me, it seems like it's a, that's a very individual thing for each of us to figure out what does quality of life mean. And um, I, I don't know if you could reflect on that a little bit in Alan's case. Yes, I think that's a really good question. So quality of life um, really meant for him uh, that he would have the energy, literally the physical energy and stamina, to be able to leave the house and do some things that were important to him. And the our spiritual community um, was a very supportive community throughout his illness and um, a loving community. And he played keyboards there in the band for seven years. So he was able to identify when he could no longer go there, you know, and, and he was able to identify ahead of time that when he was no longer able to go there, that he felt he was done. But when he reached that goal, he was so exhausted. Um, just his body was so exhausted and his mental faculties were so exhausted that he didn't have the drive to do other things. So everything kind of went hand in hand. One of the main um, characteristics of how Alzheimer's played out for him, which is not true in every situation, especially in the middle stages, is he slept an enormous amount, increasingly more so. And so he was sleeping 16 plus hours a day when he got to that point when he, he said, I can't leave the house anymore. I don't have the, even the energy to really do anything. So at that point, he was pretty much just lying in bed. Uh, he wasn't conversing much. He was, I mean, what was meaningful for him in terms of connection with people um, and relationship was no longer um, occurring for him. And he was exhausted. He was, so that degree of exhaustion really was um, um, a statement about how, you know, he, he just didn't have much life force left in that way. Mm. And I think it is very personal, you know, um, for people. It, it, it is. I mean, he didn't care anymore. Well, you know, what was so interesting is I watched him. I witnessed him letting go of everything before he died, including me. Now, on the eighth day of his fast, when he could no longer open his eyes or speak, he was able to mouth his last words to me, which was, I love you. And I was able to still communicate with him by getting close to him and saying to him, you know, if you're, if, you know, I'm here with you. And if you're comfortable, blink your eyes. I needed to make absolutely certain he was physically comfortable to make certain that he was being treated with the appropriate medication to be physically comfortable. And he was able to blink his eyes. So our communication continued in a very gentle way. But prior to him him starting the process, he really released me. Now, prior to that, we spent months, probably a couple of months, every day. We had caregivers at our house every day. And after they would leave at around 5 o'clock, he would very slowly, very gingerly walk upstairs and lay down on the couch in my big room where I have my office in a very comfortable setting, and he would rest, and I might do a little work. and most most of the time, we were embracing each other. We were thanking each other. We were crying together. We really had the time and the opportunity to acknowledge this choice that he made and how I was supporting him through it. And by the time he started his fast, we had said everything we wanted to say to each other. There really was nothing left to say. We were complete. And... And it was the most difficult thing I ever had to do, and I still had a very, very deep and long grieving process. I still miss them. You know, I still miss them. Oh, I, yes, I can so imagine that. And um, I, I want to remind anyone on the telephone, you can press star 2 if you have a question for Phyllis um, or a comment you want to make, and that will let me know that, that you would like to speak, and I'll unmute your phone line. But, um, Phyllis, along with what you were talking about, how much you still – miss him. Elaine typed in a question and said, would you talk a little bit about your emotional toll and how effective you thought counseling was in helping you? The emotional toll for me was 
uh, both in, you know, my mind, body, and spirit. I mean, I, um, I was exhausted. I mean, I got to a point of, of actual physical exhaustion, and that's when I reached out for help from um, my community. Um, and that was about probably four to five months before, or six months before he died, and that was before we actually had caregivers in the house. I mean, there was one day I can actually remember, I didn't think I'd make it through the rest of the day. I was so exhausted. And um, I, I, I really began to exercise and understand the need to reach out and ask for help. And I did that. And it's something I really encourage others to do. Um, I, you know, people cannot respond to our needs if we don't make our needs known. Nobody's a mind reader. Um, the thing about the counseling is that uh, I wasn't counseling for three years prior to, what, you know, probably, I don't know, eight months or so before he started and, and then a couple years afterward. And he even went to the counselor with me a few, a few times, and he went a couple times by himself. I would say the counseling was a way for me to witness myself and hear what was coming out of my mouth and what my emotions were. It was not the wisdom from a counselor. It was just for me to more externalize what was happening to myself. So it was almost like a verbal way of journaling. And it was a way for me to feel safe and um, in the presence of somebody else. I'm very glad I did the counseling, but I would say that what helped me the most, and it was the most difficult, was my willingness to walk in the direction of my fear. Um, probably when I was in around 50 or 50, or in my early 50s, I started reading a lot of books about death and dying. It was around the time my mother was getting ready for her transition. And so by the time Alan died, I realized that the only way out of my grief was to go all the way through it. And it was the most painful thing I ever had to do. I spent a lot of time alone. I spent a lot of time sobbing on the floor. You know, I spent a lot of time, uh, the first number of months, I mean, I, I think I had some PTSD. I couldn't go into stores and I couldn't be around bright lights. And, you know, there was some negativity. You have to understand, we, I had nobody to turn to to go through this experience. We were really kind of paving the way for a lot of other people, and we knew that we were. And so I didn't have a lot of support around me, and I know that in the future there will be, you know, a lot of support for people as this becomes more common. You know, along the lines about support, one of the things that's really significant, I don't think I've told you this, um, Karen, is that I've now been invited to be on the advisory panel for Compassion and Choices, the national organization which is responsible for the death with dignity law throughout the country, and for the meaning getting legislation, beginning to get the legislation passed in individual states. And one of the things they just started is an educational platform they're developing this educational platform to educate people about voluntary stopping eating and drinking in the face of dementia. And I've been invited to be part of their advisory council, along with mostly doctors, lawyers, professors, bioethicists, I mean, people in that genre. And, and me, I represent the person who's actually, you know, has, has gone through the experience and willing to make it all public. So, I did, I did a lot of things, and I'm, oh, the other thing that I did was I actually listened and I read books about facing fear. Um, Pema Chodron is a, is a Buddhist nun who writes about fear and courage, and I listened to retreats that she gave. I listened, I read, you know, books that she wrote, and she, it was like she was really like a private counselor to me in encouraging me to continue to face my fear and then my trusting that if I did that, it would slowly but surely begin to, to 
dissipate. And that's what happened. And it took a long time. And I'm really proud of myself that I was able to do it that way. And I didn't just immerse myself in getting really busy and, 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 uh, in other activity. I feel like I really completed that process for myself. It doesn't mean I still don't miss my husband, but I am in a new chapter of my life now. Well, it sounds to me like you took an intentional and active approach to being being with your grief and um, not running away from it, not try, not trying to repress it or hide from it, but uh, just actively allowing grief to be present in your life and then doing what you could to understand it and learn about it, which which is really beautiful. Yeah, I don't think we really can... Uh run away from it. I mean, it may come out in other ways if we try to run away from it, but I just felt, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to survive. I'm going to be a survivor. I'm going to make, I'm going to get through this. And I had, you know, and I let, and people knew how I was feeling. I mean, the other thing is I allowed myself to be vulnerable. So I allowed myself to cry in front of other people and I allowed myself to be in the grocery store aisle and running into somebody in my community and then saying, how are you doing? And I would just dissolve in tears. I allowed myself to walk through the doors of my spiritual community, you know, and, you know, it was, and let somebody wrap their arms around me and dissolve in tears. And I just allowed myself to do that until it didn't need to happen anymore. And I spent a lot of time by myself. I just, Oh, the other thing that I did do, which was a really big help, uh, probably a lot of people don't know about homeopathy. It's a form of energy medicine, and it works in a very deep way, um, both emotionally and physically. And I've used homeopathy for about the last 30 or so years, and my homeopath helped me tremendously um, with with the grief and the challenges I was going through. It helped hugely. Hmm. So oh, that's very interesting. Um, and Phyllis, you mentioned that on this advisory committee that you're on with Compassion and Choices, there are doctors on the committee. And I wanted to mention that I was really thrilled to see the portion written by Alan's doctor in your book, because it was very insightful to hear her thought process and what she went through as she was deciding, could I be a support person? Could I be part of the team? And I think that's so important for other doctors to be able to read because um, this, she was talking about exactly what doctors struggle with as they're trying to decide how do I handle death with dignity and compassion and choices? Where do I stand? How how do I fit in? And I just wanted to thank you for including that. Um, that, that was really powerful for me as a doctor to, to read. I thought, yeah. the words. I thought it was amazing how honest she was in that portion, you know, and that she was willing to be that honest, knowing that it was going to get, you know, published. And I even learned new things about her when I interviewed her about that. I mean, I, her act as if, her ability to navigate this process with Alan was so loving and extraordinary when inside herself she was struggling. It was not easy for her. It was not easy for her. But she was committed to taking care of him for the rest of his days, and she told him that once in an appointment, I will take care of you for the rest of your days. And, you know, when our hospice wouldn't help and they wouldn't step forward and help Alan, and some hospices will accept patients on the second day um, of the DSET experience, but ours would not. And when I contacted her, I, I mean, she just said, I'm committed to helping Alan. I told him I'd help him for the rest of his days, and I'm going to take care of him. And I felt that she responded to the highest calling that a doctor could respond to. Absolutely. And her determination to allow patient choice. And that's really what all all of us hope for from our medical provider, that ultimately they will honor what we choose, what we are, what we desire for the end of life. And, um, and and honor also the right the patient right to refuse medical care and refuse food and drink it's a legal right, right if a patient makes that choice and so i have to really admire her courage um it, yeah. both in accompanying alan on that part of his journey and then also being able to write about it so truthfully yeah i'm so grateful to her i still see her she's actually a doctor of osteopathy and she's become a friend, and I also see her professionally, and 
she's a remarkable person. And I think what's interesting is that she even addresses this in, in what she said in the book. But, you know, it did conflict with the way she was raised as a Catholic. It did. And I never knew that about her. I never knew she was carrying that conflict in her when she was treating him, you know, mm. as, as her patient. I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, she was a brave, um, very kind, very kind, and very professional. Hmm. Wow, that's very interesting. Well, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to be able to share her thoughts with other doctors. Um, I would too. Mention again, if you're on the telephone line, to push star two on the keypad if you want to talk with Phyllis or ask a question. But meanwhile, Sally uh, Sally typed in, Phyllis, would you please talk about the use of the word suicide, why and why you avoid it? The reason I, I'm going to see if I can even find the um, the portion in my book about suicide. The reason why I I avoided it because it's not suicide. I'm going to read just a little um, little bit from there. Because um, the reason why I really want it to be eliminated from our vocabulary um, in terms of death with dignity or VSED is because these are elective deaths. I mean, suicides, um, they're secretive. They're often violent. They're not outside the natural order. You know, they, you know, somebody just, kills himself quickly. They're usually not well considered um, with help from family or professionals, and they are devastating to others. So really it's saying a big no to life instead of saying yes to life. And the truth is Alan said yes to life up until his last breath. I mean, I literally was communicating with him, literally communicating with him up to his last breath. And so he had a peaceful death. You know, and and um, suicide is not a peaceful death. His his death was based on self love and peace and compassion for himself and for everybody around him in his close circle. Starting you know with me, his his family, his close friends. Um, it was not secretive. It was very public. In fact, we intentionally made it public in a larger sense. Um, I'm not recommending people do this, but we knew we were paving the way for others. And so we were quite public about what we were doing. He didn't die alone the way people who commit suicide die. You can't be with somebody who commits suicide. You know, Alan was surrounded by love during the whole passage of those nine and a half days. He was touched. He was massaged. He was talked to. We, he, we played his favorite music. I was in bed with him literally in a little small hospital bed with him for the last probably about four and a half, five days of his life. He was so grateful for the kind of life he had and and grateful to have the choice and the support from loved ones and a good doctor to support him through VSED. So, I mean, it's just a world of difference. In reality, you can't even put them in the same, they're just not in the same category. They're like, completely different experiences. And so I'm very careful. I really, really would like the word um, suicide to be um, taken out of this vocabulary and to use elective death. And in the professional circles that I'm in now, that is how it is being spoken about. And more and more people are beginning to speak about it that way. Death with dignity is also an elective death or it's planned out and you get two prescriptions from two different, you know, uh, uh, from two different, a prescription from two different doctors who approve of it over a three-week period of time. And you can have loved ones with you when you take the medication. You have to, you know, you have to self-administer it, but it's very well thought out and you do have to be in the last six months of life. Whereas with VSED, you, you may not be in the last six months of life. In fact, definitely not with uh, dementia, because when you're in the last six months of life with dementia, you're you're not um, you're not a mentally capable person anymore. Uh, certainly not with Alzheimer's. So I'm glad that question was asked because I like to I like to talk about that in all the public settings that I am to get people to reframe their thoughts about suicide versus elective elective death. So thank you to the Sally who asked that question. 
And then um, Phyllis Julie typed in, I very much appreciate your distinction between suicide and elective death. Neither choice is easy, but I feel it is important to not lose elective death as a choice to the negative shadow of suicide. And Jerry typed, I would like to second Julie's appreciation of your distinction between suicide and elective death. Thank you. So I think it is helpful for the rest of us as we talk about V said and death with dignity and the word, the language that we choose to use. And I think elective death is, um, is an interesting term that, that allows us to see how a person could make the choice from a different place than a person might choose suicide. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just, you know, one of the uh, biggest side effects or gifts that my husband gave me was losing, uh, you know, as much as I can honestly say, losing most of my own fear of, of my own death. And, and um, I would say underlying all my fears was my fear of my death. And I don't, I don't have that fear anymore, and it's made a difference in how I approach everything in my life. And I think that, I don't know, I've, I'm more and more, I want to walk in the direction of my fears. I don't want to be a person who pushes them away or uses substances to push them away. And we're all going to die. And I'm so grateful for the death cafe happening in this country where people can just come together with over coffee and cookies and, you know, ask questions and talk about death and dying. Um, it's, it's the ultimate mystery. It's the ultimate mystery. And it's something we're all going to have to experience. And it was remarkable to watch my husband prepare himself. He didn't talk about it a lot, but he, it was amazing to watch him just kind of layer by layer, let go of his life. You know, the last few months when people became and said, started saying their goodbyes, friends that he had known for years, they were the ones who were in tears. He really wasn't. It's amazing. You know, I mean, it's not that he didn't shed any tears. We certainly shed a lot of tears with each other. But he prepared himself, and I feel, I'm 72 years old now, and I'm, I'm preparing to die. I don't know when I'll die. And I hope I live to be a ripe old woman like my mother did, who died at 95 and a half when she was living in my house with me for the last years of her house and the last years of her life. And her heart began to wear out. She got angina. And one morning she just went into a light coma. And four days later she died. So I've been able to witness two very different kinds of death with the two people I've been the closest to in my life. And I hope I get to die quiet, you know, quickly. I mean, I don't know, for those of you who are, who are online, if you know who Louise Hay is, who, you know, started writing about affirmations and positive, positivity and um, the law of attraction, you know, uh, you know, I don't know how many years ago, How to Heal Your Life came out, maybe 30 or so. But she, she died just a few months ago. And her, one of her sayings the last while in her life was, Happy, healthy, happy, healthy, happy, healthy, happy, healthy, dead. <laughs> That's what I want. I want to be healthy, happy, healthy, happy, and, and that's it, and then dead. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, I, I do really appreciate the message. Um, and kind of knowing, because I guess I've always believed that if I prepare myself for the fact that I will die someday, and I've been I've been preparing for this all of my adult life, um, thinking about it, that it will yeah. make the dying process easier because um, I will already have faced the fears that come up, and I. And as you know, you mentioned how Alan had, he really finished some unfinished business in those last months yeah. before he died. So he really, it sounds as though he, he left did. nothing undone. And that's right. what I aspire to. I, I want to do all my work right now while I'm here and while I'm able to. And I don't want to leave it. Um, I don't want to leave it until I'm on my deathbed and suddenly in a panic, like, oh, my gosh, there are 10 people I never forgave for things they did. And right. I, and, and I don't want to die with all of this anger inside of me. So I, I admire Absolutely. that yeah. Alan 
how Alan really worked on that. And has that um, has that influenced you at all in your process? Hugely. Oh, my gosh, hugely. I mean, as I go through my life, day by day, I just don't, I won't let myself build up ne- and negativity. I mean, I, I have to find outlets for it in a healthy, positive way. And I, I do that. I do that. I would say I'm living from a place of compassion and kindness and understanding as best as I can every day of my life. And I hope to be a growing, learning human being up to the time I take my last breath. I aspire to do that, but I take care of business now as I as I go along. And some maybe not to my satisfaction always. I mean, there's a lot of acceptance that has that comes along with the challenges that we have in our life. I mean, it's not like I have every single relationship with every person on the face of this earth is perfect for me, but I feel like I'm more understanding and my heart is open more and I'm more compassionate to the other. And it's, it's, it's an ongoing journey of, of, of growing and learning and understanding. And I'm well, I, that's how I want to live. That's how I am living. Well, I, I remember reading uh, when you were talking about Alan's decision to, um, to voluntarily stop eating and drinking and that he, that's when he, seem to recognize that there's more work I need to do. And it makes me wonder if there is a point for each one of us when we see our health dwindling or when we see that we're entering into this, maybe the last stages of life, if something awakens in us, this desire, like, and we suddenly see more more work that we could do than we were aware of before. I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts well, about that. I, I do. I think that, well, my thoughts are, they're not, it's not an answer, but my thoughts are we're all on our own trajectory, our own journey, our own life journey. And how we grow, how we mature, how we resolve the challenges in our lives happen to us in an individual, unique way. I mean, Alan was aware, for example, of the challenges he had um, by being raised with a loving but very critical mother uh, and how that affected him. And it wasn't until probably the last two months of his life that he got the proper professional help to truly forgive her and to understand why she might have been that way and what her life might have been like. For somebody else, they may have never, for- they might not ever forgive their mother. For somebody else, they might be able to forgive their mother when they're 42 years old or 28 years old or whatever our challenges are. And I think that the life journey is so individual in terms of what we need to navigate so that we can be free inside and not carry burdens. And and I think my my work, my ongoing work is is to do that on a, on a daily basis without that being a burden. I mean, it's not like I want to be always releasing my challenges, but yeah. I'm aware that I'm on my own unique journey and, and I want to live, I want to live consciously. I don't want to be asleep. I want to live as fully as I can and then let my life go with grace. I, I was thinking along the lines of Louise Hayes quote, loving, yeah. learning, loving, learning, loving, learning, Dead. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. 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 Happy, healthy. Happy, healthy. <laughs> happy. I heard her say that once on an interview. It was so funny. You know, I mean, she was, and you know what? She died in her sleep. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that really is. At 90. When she was 90 years old, several months ago, she died in her sleep. And wow. I believe she really did say to herself over and over, happy, healthy, happy, healthy, happy, healthy, dead. <laughs> well, um, Phyllis, Kathy asked the question, Are do you know, are there any dedicated facilities for helping people who have chosen VSED? The only dedicated facilities that I know of is there are some hospices throughout I, I'm going to say I know them in Washington. I don't know about other states. I live in the state of Washington. And there are some hospices and medical directors at those hospices who will accept people on the second day 
of the DSED experience. Um, that's all that I know. Um, I think there's, there's, there's um, a lot that's going to occur, I think, through this process with compassion and choices in developing an educational platform around DSED. And as a result, there will be a lot more supportive opportunities for people. Clearly, essential medical support is absolutely necessary in going through the VSET process. This is not something that you just decide willy-nilly and stop eating and drinking one day or you say to your son or your daughter or your nephew, you know, I'm going to stop eating and drinking tomorrow. It's not like that. I mean, the the the... The dehydration process more, and you know this, of course, better than I do, Karen, as a doctor, but my understanding is the dehydration process that can, you know, cause the, the pain. There could be delirium. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can, that can happen. And the reason why Alan had a good death and not, and, and was, and kept, we kept him comfortable was because of our preparation. So there aren't a lot of places now. However, anybody has the right in their own home with the proper support, you know, to be able to do this. I believe down the road we'll, 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 we will have a lot more um, support in, from hospices. I think hospice is going to be key in this down mm-hmm. the road. And yes, I I was thinking because it's it's a huge undertaking for family members. I mean, there may be family members who may not be able to offer the support the patient needs, and uh, the idea of having facilities that are prepared and ready to handle VSED um, would be. I think that's really crucial and something that we need to look at for the future. I, I agree. Um, I was clear I did not want to be the one taking care of his physical body while he was dying. I wanted to be there from a place of love and be with him emotionally and be able to snuggle with him when we still could. Um, we had a long-term care insurance policy, which actually paid for our caregivers, which most people do not have. And, um, I, you know, yet proper support is necessary. And however people get it, um, it's essential. In, you know, I know of a couple, uh, several instances of people who contacted me whose husbands died through VSED and, um, you know, it wasn't, it didn't go quite as, it went, they, it was fine, but, you know, it didn't go quite as smoothly. I mean, they kind of waited almost too late to get the proper medical support and, and um, you know, every situation is going to be different, but um, there also, I've gotten feedback of instances where it was as positive as the experience that Alan had because we were properly, you know, prepared. And the reason, one of the reasons why hospice is going to be so essential is because it costs money to have, you know, um, to hire caregivers. Uh, Some doctors bill for it however they bill for it. I mean, you know, it's an undertaking. It requires Mm -hmm. adequate support. Yes, definitely. And Phyllis, you mentioned that you had long-term care insurance. I'm just, right. I, I'm just wondering about this from a practical perspective. Looking back, would you recommend that other people consider getting long-term, long-term care mm-hmm. insurance? Yeah. I mean, not that you're. A, <laughs> I just, I'm oh, just yeah. curious about it. <laughs> I think that's a great question. And Karen, I have thought about that. We got long-term care insurance when Alan was 66 years old. And I was 56 years old. And I got it at the same time because we could get a discount if we, if we did it at the same time. And my big fear was that he was going to get Alzheimer's because there was so much neurological disease between the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's on both sides of his family. But you know what? In all honesty, when I think about it now for myself, if I were that 56-year-old or 60-year-old and I didn't have it already, I don't think I would get it. I am not advising that people not get it. But I am so clear for myself that I do not want to linger in my life in a state of suffering and dis-ease that I would either choose death with dignity if necessary, if I had a terminal disease within the last six months, or I would be said if I, if I get dementia. And whatever money 
I, I mean, I have spent far more money on premiums than it would cost me to deset. Mm-hmm. I would recommend people to set money aside and be, know that they have a little pool of money if they needed it, you know. Yeah. That's really what I feel now. That really is what I feel. This is not any kind of legal or medical advice. It's just <laughs> what at all. I'm going to say that over and over, you know. I mean, as a disclaimer, I'm not advising it for anybody, but for myself, that's where I have matured into. That's what I've grown into. That understanding. Hmm. So that's that's an interesting perspective. I'm glad to hear that from you. Thanks for uh, for asking that and <laughs> for answering that. Um, yeah. I also wondered because you live in Washington, which is a right to die state. Um, do you feel it was any easier for you to go through the paperwork and, and get everything? in place that you needed than it might be for someone who lives in a different state where the um, right to die is not, is not accepted by law, but also not by the majority of people who live in the state? I think that's a good question. Now, VSTED is, is a legal option. It has to be differentiated from death with dignity, which is not a legal option unless you go through the protocol that's designated in particular states. However, because I live in Washington, which was um, had a uh, you know uh, um, end of life support organization in Washington when this occurred for Alan, um, a couple things happened which were very helpful. Um, I they worked already supporting people in a kind of lightweight kind of way through Visa at that time. Um, I pretty much had to figure most of it out on my own. But I now, today, they, they are supporting people a lot more in terms of educating people and helping them and guiding people. Um, but um, one of the things that Washington State has, and I encourage people, no matter what state you live in, to look at End of Life Washington's website. Their legal documents are phenomenal. And um, they... They have a document called the, um, I think it's the, it's something like the Advanced Mental Health and Alzheimer's Directive, um, or Health Directive for Alzheimer's, something like that. And, and, um, Alan might have been the first person to actually fill out that document. And I was talking to the executive director on the phone. This was, you know, within six months or four months prior to his death. And the, that document was just going to be uh, produced and made public for the first time. And it was, the document was completed, but the instructions as to how to use the document were not completed. And the executive director at the time said to me, I will email you this document, Phyllis, if you promise me you will fill it out with an elder care attorney. And I made him that promise. And, you know, in 15 minutes I had the document. And um, I filled out as much as I could by myself. And there were certain sections that really did need the help of an elder care attorney. And um, it was very helpful that we had an elder care attorney. I do not think that, you know, people are going to, everyone's going to need this, you know, down the road um, as this becomes more commonplace. And there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to become more commonplace. But I think having all your I's dotted and your, you know, T's crossed now is a good thing, and and um, uh, so there were some things that you know she really did help us navigate, and there were parts that she helped us fill out. And I, th- I just encourage people to look at their documents. Their end of life documents are extraordinary; they're the best I've seen, and they're the ones that I use. I did not go to my elder care attorney and ask her to draw up my own health directive or living will. I took the one off of End of Life Washington's website and added my own attachment, which is all, including the attachment, you know, witness and notarize. Mm. Very interesting. That's very helpful, Phyllis. Um, And I I wanted to mention also, I know that a lot of people out there are beginning to teach classes and courses for people on advanced directives. And I feel that everyone should know about VSED because it, it, because people need to be informed of it as an option and need to know their rights and, and also need to understand it and what 
what it consists of and how it could be utilized if necessary. And so, um, so I really want to encourage people to read your book, which is why I chose it for this reading group because yeah. it's such important information for people to have. Yes, I agree. Um, I think it's very important for every person to have, even young adults. You know, I mean, and there's a lot of interest that I get from people who are young adults whose grandparents, you know, have dementia and and so forth. And boy, if the if the film gets produced as I as I hope it will, you know, um, that it will be a milestone for millions and millions and millions of people in terms of understanding this as a as a gentle, if done properly, way to die, a loving way if done properly. Well, uh, yes, and I would love to see the word get out to every hospice, um, to every palliative care doctor or in, anyone yeah. who works with people in, in, in later life uh, to understand understand VSED and and view it as an option and something that they they have an obligation to learn about and know about and understand in order right. to help their yeah. patients if patients should make that choice. Yeah. One one of my personal dreams is to do some teaching with a doctor to, to people in medical school, the younger doctors, or to any doctors, but especially the younger doctors. And the foreword to my book um, is written by one of the most well-known palliative care doctors in our country, who's Dr. Timothy Quill. He's in Rochester, New York, and works out of the Med Center there. And he wrote the foreword to my book and is also um, one of the significant doctors on the advisory panel with Compassion and Choices now, along with, you know, other professionals, myself, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think, let's see, Elaine asked, um, how could we incorporate VSED education when we're teaching people about advanced care documents? Um, so I don't know if you have any any thoughts about that, Phyllis? Yes. Um, there is a film called Speaking of Dying. Um, it's produced by Trudy James, T-R-U-D-Y-J-A-M-E-S. Trudy is actually the person who educated me about VSED when she was doing volunteer chaplaincy work for End of Life Washington, and that's how I learned about it. She produced a film called Speaking of Dying, it's available on Amazon, and on, in that film, it, it um, discusses about five or six different ways to die and interviews people about different choices people are making in the preparations for their end of life and for their health directives. I'm on that film as the person who's interviewed for VSED. So what I think is important, and the reason why I'm recommending the film is because it's a beautiful context. It's only 35 minutes long. Um, it's about maybe $20 to buy. Um, to, to look at death from different perspectives. Trudy also, uh, and she has a wonderful model of training facilitators to work with individuals in groups of about, oh, eight to 10 or so, seven to 10, who get together for I don't know how many sessions, four or six sessions, and talk about death and dying, talk about their issues, and during the course of these classes over a four- to six-week period, end up talking with their families and end up filling out their health directive, and then it's all done at the end in that supportive situation. So I think that what has to happen is the, the topic of death and dying needs to be deepened and broadened so that the various ways, whether it's through death with dignity, whether it's through VSED, whether somebody wants to go the very last day with as much chemo that they, as they possibly can, what, whatever, whatever somebody's choice is, that they really take the time to explore um, what their choices are. And I think that um, speaking of dying is an excellent, um, is an excellent uh, film. And Trudy has a uh, website. If you just Google her name, Trudy James. And she's a wonderful resource. She's turning 80 this year, and she's a remarkable woman. And I highly recommend um, either becoming one of her facilitators. She's even trained people who live in other states. So use her as a resource for sure. Contact her if necessary. Oh, thank you so much, Phyllis. Elaine says thank you also. Um, 
And yeah, my perspective was that uh, sometimes I think just completing a living will may give some people a false assurance that now I did, I signed this form, I have this paperwork, so now I know I'll have control over how I die. But I think it's really important that we be honest with people that if they if they develop dementia in their later years, um, they will not be able to speak for themselves and they will not have a chance to control the end of life unless they are proactive and unless they get information in advance about their options. So, so I feel like it's just something that should be incorporated and included when we're talking about pe to people about writing down their wishes that they understand, right. as you said, the broader picture of, of what could happen and what they, how to prepare for various possibilities in later life. Right. And in today's world, as we know it, if you fill out your health directive and mention what you might like your wishes to, or what your wishes are, if you develop dementia and end up in a facility, um, there is no guarantee in today's world that those wishes will be honored. Um, most likely in most facilities today, they will not be honored. And that is something that um, will absolutely be addressed through this educational platform um, uh, with, with um, Compassion and Choices. And it's a big reason why this is being done, because there are a lot of people who are going to face that. And also I want to mention, um, every year I sit down with my two health agents, my first and second one, and, and, um, and I go through what my wishes are with them. My daughter is not one of my health agents. She's number three, but that's only in case she lives in Europe and in case I were um, in Europe when I died, I, I would want her to be on there. But other than that, um, I felt more comfortable um, it just being trusted friends who I feel are more capable than she is in following through with my wishes. But I have already probably sat down with my daughter and my health agents probably three times and gone through everything. And as I become, you know, I'm on my own learning curve. And as I become aware of, of my rights and my own health directive changes, um, I always get together with my health agents and I go through it. So I think it's very naive, like you say, Karen, if someone just because you fill out a health directive does not mean that it's going to be, that it's going to be followed. So this is like really, really important stuff. And I think that filling out our health directives and, and facing that document with our own current dignity will help us begin to come to deeper terms about our own death and to think uh, about it. Exactly. And to come full circle to think about what does quality of life mean for you? Um, what, right. what represents quality of life? And let that inform your decisions as well as you're looking at what choices you might like to make at the end of life. What is quality? And, um, and be thinking about that for all of your life. How do I live a life that has, has quality and is filled with what I value and what really matters to me? Right, and it will be different for different people. In yeah. other words, there's no judgment about that. It will be different for different people. And exactly. that is to be honored. Exactly, which is why each of us needs to do the work, <laughs> do the processing, think about it, and then and prepare ourselves as best we can. That's right. Absolutely. Well, Phyllis, I, I just, I love your passion. I, I just love your dedication to this cause and how you are, you're just a, a force to be reckoned with <laughs> right now in the world. And I love everything that you're doing. And I want to thank you. Thank you for the book. Thank you for your work. Um, I'm hoping, hoping the movie comes to pass because that, I think that yeah. would be wonderful. And um, I, and Thanks so much for just being here and talking with all of us. Thank you. And I want you to know and all the listeners to know that um, I do have a website and people can contact me through my website, which is just phyllisschachter.com. And also, Karen, I just want to thank you for your dedication and the kind of work that you're doing today. I mean, I feel like you're a league unto yourself in, in the breadth and depth of all aspects around death and dying that you are approaching and sharing and educating others with 
And I very much appreciate how you've interviewed me in the past and how you are um, helping me further my work. We're doing this together. We're doing this together. And I, I just want to say thank you. Well, it's it's an honor for me to be uh, part of your team, Phyllis. <laughs> so thanks. Thank um, you. thanks again. And thanks, everyone who tuned in, everyone on the phone. And I know a lot of people have been on um, the computer listening in, too, that we haven't heard from. Um, and then lots of people are going to be listening to the recording later. So um, so to all of you, I want to say have a good evening and a good week. And Phyllis, to you, especially many blessings to you. Thank you. And to you, Karen. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll say goodbye for tonight then. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.